get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm going to introduce today's guest, Randall Kaplan, in a second. But Randy, I always like to mention past guests of people to check out. And some of the past guests you, that are must listen to, the founder of Paylocity, Steve Sarowitz, he started in a 600 square foot office, grew it to a billion dollar company that went public. Uh, the founder of Nolan, uh, Atari, Nolan Bushnell, was Steve Jobs' mentor. He talked about in the interview, Randy, you'll get a kick out of this, that um, Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000. And he talked about why he said no to that. And I know we're going to talk about jump investors and we'll see if you've turned down any of those, those type of deals in your uh, uh, you know, journey. But um, anywhere from the stories of founders of RX Bar, Quest Nutrition, many more, you could check them out at inspiredinsider.com. Uh, before I introduce Randall Kaplan, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And um, we do that by helping you run your podcast. And we are a uh, easy button to do that. And, you know, Randy, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to relationships. You know, the person who introduced us, Larry Benet, is, is like the biggest giver I know of yeah. relationships. And I love, having people and companies on my podcast that I respect and admire. And that's why I asked you to come on. So if anyone has thought about launching and, and running a podcast, uh, we are an easy button to go to rise25.com. And today's guest, uh, like I said, big shout out to Larry Bernay. He is a master. He speaks to lots of organizations in the art of connecting. Check him out. But um, Randall Kaplan is a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and uh, he's a co-founder of uh, Kami Technologies. If you've never Akamai. heard of it, Akamai Technologies. Uh, Akamai, got it. Um, if you haven't heard of, it, like I hadn't, but it basically powers thirty percent of the world's web traffic, practically. And it's a member of S and P five hundred. Employs nearly eight thousand people with over sixty four offices, and it had three point two billion dollars in twenty twenty revenues. If it gives you any idea of the size and capacity of it. And he's also founder and CEO of Jump Investors. It's a venture capital firm. Since its formation in 1999, they've invested in more than 60 early to late stage technology companies. Some of you probably have heard of like Google, Lyft, Seagate, and many more. They also invest in real estate and in other uh, private equity and other uh, genres. And there's several other ventures. You know, I don't even know how you do it all, uh, Randy, like Sandy, Thrive Properties, Collar Card that makes patented men's collar stays. He has a podcast, which you should check out. It's called In Search of Excellence. He's had people like Sam Zell, Sharon Stone, and many, many more. He has a book called Bliss. Randy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. And Nolan is awesome, by the way. I met him two years ago at a function. We chatted for a long time. His son also has a really cool business as well. So. The family definitely has a DNA. Uh, are you going to have him on the podcast or your I podcast? haven't asked him yet, but he, I, I should. I appreciate the reminder. Yeah, totally. Totally. We'll have to send him a quick message after this and get him on. Um, there's so much, you know, when I did research on you, you've, you have a really amazing career and it's not just in for-profit, but non-for-profit, which I want to talk about too. But I wanted to kind of start at the beginning and we were talking a little bit before we hit record is go back to your 27 year old self and you're presented with this opportunity and talk about how you got that opportunity and some of the lessons. Well, the first thing that I think to think about is you have to create your own. All the interesting jobs I've had have come from not a job listing. I went out and I found them, but I started my career as a lawyer. I went to Northwestern law school. I did very well there. And I came out to Los Angeles to practice law. And that was the beginning of a spectacularly horrible career in the practice of law. I lost my job five and a half weeks after moving here. I had not found out if I had passed the bar yet, which I did. I had $3,000 in the bank and I was looking at waiting tables. And unfortunately, it was a bad legal climate, which is why I was laid off. So it was hard to find a job. I got a job in Orange County. And as naive as this sounds, I had never heard of Orange County before. 
So I commuted from Westwood 53 and a half miles to work every day. Took me three hours round trip. If there was a traffic jam, could take up to four hours. I'd leave my apartment at 5.30 in the morning, get there at seven and rarely came home before midnight. And after six months of that, I went to the managing partner in downtown Los Angeles. I said, I'd like to move down there. He said, no, we want you to move down there or leave the firm. So I was now looking for my third job, my first year out of school, which is definitely not the way to go. So I ended up getting a great job at a Los Angeles-based law firm, uh, for a Chicago-based law firm in their Los Angeles um, office. They had about 90 lawyers there, and I had a great boss there, two, two people. I took a tax job. I had no interest in tax law, but I thought people would think I'm smarter than I am because... Tax law is a very arcane thing to grasp and comprehend. So shortly after starting there, I always wanted to be in business. I always had the gene to start my own business. I had a t-shirt business in college, but I went to law school as a means to an end. So I started plotting my way out of being a lawyer without going to business school. I was making at the time... Uh, Big law firms all paid the same wage. I was making $70,000 a year in 1993. Today, the wage is, I think, $165,000 for the big firms. But that was a lot of money back then. I thought I was rich making that much money. 100%. Yeah. uh, It it was good money. So uh, essentially what I did is I, I thought I had to do something unique and different than what other people do. I wasn't just going to write letters to CEOs to meet with me or to companies or look for uh, job ads. I wanted to be the right-hand man to someone successful, the right-hand person to someone successful. And I had an idea. I was going to write letters to all of the CEOs in Los Angeles, starting with the studios, because there are people, a guy named Strauselnik was running Fox at age 30. I, I wrote him a letter, by the way, and we're still good friends today. And he was a guest on my podcast as well. And I thought that looked like a business where meritocracy ruled the day. So I started there and I started focusing on people who had been a lawyer and had transitioned into a successful business career who were then the CEOs of large companies. And so I branched out my search to not only the entertainment companies, but large companies like Sun America, like Hoffman and Broad. And I wrote 300 letters. And when I started this process, I told a few friends. And everybody said, these people are never going to meet with you, ever. A cold letter to someone running a $20 billion public company, never going to happen. But I had an idea. I had an idea to be different. Sometimes I think a little differently than people. People will say, uh, okay, that's interesting. I've never heard of that before. They mean it as a criticism and I take it as a compliment. <laughs> right. So, and, and when people tell me that something can't be done and I think it can be done, then I want to prove them wrong, but I really want to prove myself right. I want to trust my gut and I'm very persistent when I want to do things. So in this case, the idea was I was going to write letters um, that requested um, informational meetings, not jobs. And what I did that was unique is I went on LexisNexis. There were no Google. Uh, there was no uh, Google back then. So you had to, I had to use a paid subscription with the law firm. I charged it to marketing. And I did all this research. I printed out every uh, piece of press written on these people for the last 20 years. So then I highlighted them. My two-bedroom um, apartment was a letter-writing factory, the second bedroom where I had, I had compiled the list. I had stacks of information, five inches thick on all these printouts with names on top, Sumner Redstone, et cetera, et cetera. And then I compiled the facts from that research and I integrated them into a very unique, different kind of a letter. Uh, It was spiral bound with the self and cover. It was tabbed. I had certain things in there that were unique. I put my transcript from Michigan. I was Phi Beta Kappa my junior year, only one of 10 students graduated at uh, Northwestern, did very well there also, and was involved in some other things in, in my life too. So it was very unique. It was very different. And it was something that they had never seen before. So I tracked all this on Excel. I tracked the day I sent the letter, the phone calls, the follow-up. I was very persistent. Steve Bolenbach was the CEO of Marriott back then. He was on my hit list. 
And I sent him a letter. I called his office once a week for 27 weeks I'm in a row. His secretary was a woman named Ophelia Reese. I still remember this 20 something years later. And she was my, my friend, you know, she was rooting for me for him to take the meeting. One day she called me uh, in my office at the law firm and said, are you in your office? Yes. Hang on. He's going to call you in the next 10 minutes. And he finally called and, and persistence paid. The meeting went nowhere, uh, but you never know where it's going to take you. And if you do your research, and your persistent people will meet with you. The end of the story there is, I wrote 300 letters, I got 80 meetings. Sumner Redstone, the CEO of Disney. The great percentage. Uh, really. top, it, it was a very high percentage. Uh, this went from a guarantee that people said would be zero. And everybody I met with said, these people are, uh, said they had never taken a letter from a cold meeting before. And when I got these meetings, I did research. You're doing research for the podcast. I do research for my podcast. I spend about 15 um, hours of my own time preparing for my podcast, and then I have someone on my team do the research. So each podcast takes about 30 hours each, which is intensive, but I want to make sure I'm the most prepared. And I went into these job interviews, and this is what I tell the many people that I mentor, my goal was to be the single most prepared person to walk into a mad office ever. And just the kind of prep that I did for the Sun America meeting with um, Eli Broad was, it was a public company. I read the 10K, the 10Q. I studied for like a final um, exam. And that's my advice. You're, you're going to spend more time at work than at home with your family. You should spend more than, you know, one hour looking over a website and some people have come to my office and not even known the names of our portfolio companies, which means they spent no time. I mean, they're all on, on our website. So I um, outlined the 10K, the annual report. I memorized it. I studied for it. I memorized 20 questions, including notes from the financial statements of things I didn't really know because I wanted to tick these off. And in that meeting, the long of it was the meeting, the, the long and short of it was the meeting went very, very well. And we spent 90 minutes together. I, I ended up working there for three years. I never had a 90 minute uh, meeting with him again, one on one. And the meeting went well. He would start talking about something. He told me about this job. He had the assistant to the chairman job. And I said, I know about the job. Five people have had it. I gave them the names, what years they had it, and what they were doing with their life today. And Eli was scribbling furiously. You know, he was nodding, nodding, nodding. So he was taking notes, which was, which was a good thing. I left the office and he said, I, I, no promises. I, I said, I, I you love that job. No promises. Uh, I want you to take one business class at UCLA, go get a catalog, and then send it back to me, and I'll pick one for you. So at that point, I left his office, drove to UCLA, got a class catalog, parked, ran around campus. It was 90 degrees that day. I'm running around with my suit and tie. I'm soaking wet with sweat. I parked. I found one. I got a ticket on the car, on my car, drove back to uh, my um, apartment typed a thank you letter, had it back at his receptionist within the hour. And there's a lot to the story as you think about what I did. It's making first impressions. Making first impressions really count. I could have waited a day. I could have gone to UCLA the next day. The follow-up would have been fine, but it was different. It showed what I'm made of. It showed my personality. It showed how badly I wanted the job. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned. So his assistant called me back two weeks later, said, Mr. Broad would like you to take one of two classes. I said, I'll take them both. And long story short, I got a job offer there on my 27th birthday. And I ended up working for him for, for three years. Incredible opportunity. That was my big break. But the story of how does a 27-year-old, horribly unsuccessful lawyer end up as the assistant to the chairman for someone who started two Fortune 500 companies? And that's, there are a lot more details there, but those are the broad strokes of, of how that happened. I was very lucky. 
I think you create your own luck. Um, and that was my, that was my big break. You do create your own luck and people can tell the research too, Randy. And I want to hear some of the lessons you learned from him, but you know, one of the things that sticks out is you are the ultimate direct response copywriter. I mean, with all those letters, but it comes down to, I went on a stint of interviewing some of the top direct response copywriters, marketers on the planet. And it comes down to research, right? Knowing the customer or the person on the other side is really what it comes down to. And, and that's really what you went deep on for all of these, because a 300 letters and 80 responding and getting meetings. I mean, there's responding and not getting meetings too. So that was, that's pretty amazing. There's, so there's one other footnote too, that, that I, um, that I want to say. So I wrote letters to these people and I, one of the letters I wrote to was a guy named David Hermelin who lived in Detroit. I grew up in Detroit and he was an icon in the business community, very philanthropic. So I write him a letter. I'm going to Detroit the next day. Or um, once we uh, uh, set up a meeting, I, I flew there. Uh, he wanted me to meet him at 7 a.m. at a deli, which is 4 a.m. my time. And I said, and I take in the red eye. So um, it didn't leave me a lot, of, a lot of time. Came straight from the airport. And I get there, and there's a line of people waiting to see him. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. So I got my turn in the booth. And he said, okay, got your letter. That's great. Uh, what do you want to do? I told him what I wanted to do. And I told him I had a bunch of meetings so far. And he said, well, what do you do during the meetings? Do you request and say that I want a job? I said, no. He asked, why not? And I said, you know, they've done so much for me. You know, they're taking the meeting. I sort of feel bad about it. And he said, that's a huge mistake. Ask for the order when you're there. He sold life insurance. That's how he made his fortune. You don't wake up one morning and say, I need life insurance. I'm super excited, but you got to buy it from somebody. So he rang the bell, but he also told me that I'm going to get one shot at these people. And sometimes you take the advice of people, even successful people, and you say, okay, I hear what he's saying. Uh, you ask for the order, but I said, I'm going to have a lot of shots. I want to develop relationships with these people. And so I ended up not having a lot of shots with these people. I mean, you have one shot to make a good uh, first impression. And I've got a podcast coming out uh, with a bunch of lessons on how to do that. But I also was able to develop relationships with people like uh, Strauss Zelnick, who I met through a cold letter. We're, we're friends many years later. Uh, he's co-invested with me in some of our companies. Um, so, so you never know where these relationships will come from. You know, Randy, I, I'm going to have you talk about the book Bliss, but, but I am going to make a case for your next book on this okay. podcast, okay? Okay. And so out of the 300 letters, yeah. you get 80 responses. How many meetings do you think you got? Do you remember? Uh, around 65. 65. Yeah. I would love a book that yeah. has a lesson and maybe it's not all 65, but maybe yeah. 60, 60. <laughs> I want to hear all the lessons okay. from each of those meetings, even if it was a led to nothing, right? Cause there's all the lesson right. in there. What, what were you say out of those meetings? Do you remember like your top, that was one like huge lesson is like, just ask for the order from him. What were some right. other lessons that people instilled on you in those meetings? Uh, well, I've got a lot of funny stories to tell, but I'll tell you a lesson first. Uh, and I keep coming back to him. Uh, Strauss Zelnick is someone I um, admire immensely. He's brilliant, Harvard, uh, JD MBA, running Fox at 30, running BMG at 40. He was chairman of CBS. He runs Zelnick Media. They manage $25 billion. Uh, CEO and chairman of uh, Take Two, a publicly traded gaming company, I think with an 18 billion dollar market cap. But when I met him the first time, um, I went to a conference. Someone told me, if you want to go, if you want to hunt moose, go where the moose are. So there's this big conference. One of the bankers who was a uh, senior banker, then it, uh, uh, Bear Stearns, I wrote him a cold letter. At the end of the meeting, I said, you know, who else should I meet? He said, come to my conference. So I took a day off of work. I went to the, this conference. I met him as he was leaving. He was in New York. And I said, hey, Strauss, and you speak, and then you have the entourage and the circle following you out. He was flying back to New York. 
he said, call me. I call him. He set up a meeting in Los Angeles, a big office here. And I studied for these meetings. People ran late. So I had a cheat sheet because I had memorized all of my questions. So I kept it in my suit pocket and I read it and then I put it away. I wanted to memorize my questions before I got in there. And he's running a minute and a half late. I'm looking at my watch. He walks out into the lobby. He's on the phone. And he puffers, I'm super sorry. Um, I'm running a few minutes late. I'll come get you. It wasn't his assistant. It wasn't the office manager. But that's an amazing lesson of who he is, how he treats people. When I got there, I got there. I would get there one hour before my meetings. Why? Because I live in LA. I plan ahead. There's traffic jams. The hour would give me some way to to get there and that happened never show up late to a meeting um and when i when i got there i i would walk in 15 minutes before the meeting and i remember her name liz ramirez was the office manager she was sitting there and she said you're like best friends with all of these people because you talk to them once a week probably forever (laughs) well um liz was awesome and she said um strauss will be out soon Strauss, not Mr. Zelnick. And again, you, you take these lessons, you're 27 years old, or sorry, I was 26 years old, and you hear these lessons and you, you start thinking, God, I, I really want to learn something from these people. Then you have something on the flip side. In, in the world is a small world, okay? I was a lawyer begging for a job. I wanted to work at um, O'Melveny and Myers, which is one of the best firms. I, the legal market picked up. I had callbacks there, downtown and other uh, Century City office. No offer. I was devastated. But sometimes the biggest disappointments turn into you know, the best opportunities. I couldn't have gotten the Sun America job if the um, O'Melveny thing happened because that was a law firm we used at Sun America. And the ironic part of all this, I get to Sun America. I'm not practicing law. And I'm now working with some of the partners who I had met with where I didn't get a job offer from. So the world is a very round world. And in my job search, I met with one of the most successful producers of all time, uh, someone who ran a, a uh, studio. I met him. He wanted me to come to his house. I pulled up to his mansion in Beverly Hills, the gates, the home is up on the hill. And there's a woman in front of me in a bikini top. She's very pretty, Mercedes convertible. We drive in, she goes left by the pool. I could see her parked. I pull up to this massive house. Someone comes to greet me. Um, he's running late. I'm sitting basically in this kitchen on a, on, uh, a counter and there's pictures of him and um, every president of the United States in the last 30 years. So he calls me into his office and he puts his feet up on the desk. I could see the imprint of the Ferragamo shoes, uh, the Ferragamo shoes. And we talk about the movie business. They said, you know, do you love the movie business? I said, I didn't grow up wanting to be in movies or in the movie business, uh, but I like the meritocracy. I work hard. I think I'm bright. And he said, this is not for you. I started in the mailroom. You got to have a passion for it. It was a very good meeting. He was very nice, very blunt, which is great. But I remember the shoe in my face. So several years later, um, I go to a party in Malibu. This is post Akamai, and he's there. And he's there with a beautiful woman. And we start talking. I didn't raise this with, with him, by the way, there, but he ended up being a parent in my kid's school. And I went out to dinner with he and his wife and my wife, Madison. And I said to him, you know, we'll call him, we'll call him Joe, but that's not, he said, you know, you know, Joe, we met a long time ago, back in nineteen ninety-five. No, and I mean, he's met with you know tons yeah. of people, and I told him the story, and I, I I left out the shoe in the face part. Um, I I didn't think that there was nothing to, to be gained from that, but I remembered it vividly, and then I told him the story, and he obviously knew about all the things that I had done. And he said, Oh, that's so great. It's a good thing you didn't go into the movie business. And then then the footnote is his wife is there. And he says, that was me in the bikini pulling in. I thought you were going to say she went left to the pool and then you went left and skipped the meeting. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No one, no one, no one asked me to do that. Uh, 
<laughs> the pool looked big. It, it, it looked fun, but no, I, I was uh, very prepared, ready to roll when I pulled up to his front door. Randy, I'm wondering what's going on inside your head with these meetings. You know, um, it can be intimidating and there could be self-talk going on for people. Did Tons. you have that going on for you? Tons. You know, one of the great motivations of all time is the fear of failure. I felt it then as a lawyer. I mean, I had failed badly. I'd never failed in my life before. I was at the top of my class wherever I went. I was a nerdy kid, but I sort of came into my own, became less nerdy in college. My kids still think I'm very nerdy, um, but I had, I had always done well. I could control the outcome through my hard work. I think hard work is the greatest determinant of our success. And I knew almost always going into all the tests I had that I was going to get an A. I got one B plus at uh, uh, Michigan first term. I was very disappointed in myself, but I think you can control the outcome. But you start going into these meetings. And, and so then I had a very unsuccessful legal career. And then I start going out and thinking, gosh, I'm hearing all these voices. These people are never going to meet with me. And I said, I'm an entrepreneur. I know I think a little differently and that's okay. Uh, successful people have been told no a million times, how stupid something is, how something is not going to happen and you trust your gut. But when I'm in these meetings, Jeremy, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, I mean, I was so nervous. Am I going to blow this? Are they going to like me? My goal was go in there, show my research and impress them. Good things will happen. And they did, but I was, I was extremely nervous, you know, going on in my head. What are they thinking? You try to gauge the audience and see how they're reacting to you. Some people don't know how to do that, right? They just keep talking, keep talking. Part of a good conversation is being a good listener. So as the interviewer, as uh, the interviewee, sometimes it's good to flip the switch. The interview becomes the interviewer and it allows for a more healthy discussion and it also makes a good first impression as well. It shows that you want to know what they're doing and they want to know about uh, the experience. But yeah, I mean, what was going on in my mind is, you know, don't mess this up. You got one shot and your future could be standing right in front of you. No and, pressure and by there. The way, no pressure. Uh, you know, I, I feel pressure every day today. I have a number of businesses. What if they fail? What if I make mistakes? I make a lot of mistakes, by the way. I'm in the venture capital business. So we have a 20% you know, batting average, which is normal for a venture capital firm. So you look stupid and lose 100% of your money um, eight times out of 10, roughly. Sometimes it's a little better, sometimes a little more. Uh, and you hope that the winners make up for the losers. But fear of failure, I think that's one of our great motivators on a daily basis. It's still one of mine uh, today. Yeah. It's like Hall of Fame baseball players, right? I mean, you're in the Hall of Fame if you bat 300, right? You, That's right. You know, get out 70% of the time and it seems the same for that. I want to have you mention the book to Bliss, but I, I, you know, talking about what you just said, I do want to hear after you talk about the book, um, maybe one of the uh, investments you made that maybe looked like it was dead, a big surprise for you. But talk about Bliss for a second. Sure. Well, to talk about Bliss, we have to talk about um, Sandy first. Go ahead. So I'm a beach lover. The beach is my happy place. I went with my wife, Madison, to Greece when we started dating in 2013. We went to the concierge of our hotel. We wanted Black Sand Beach. He whipped out a paper map. She unfolded it, 32 parts, she with a Sharpie. I think there's one over here. We're in a little Fiat convertible. We drive out there for two hours. No food, no bathroom, nothing. Uh, the road wasn't marked. We went through what looked like a road. Weeds taller than our Fiat. I'm thinking um, the movie uh, Taken. We're going to get kidnapped. <laughs> right, exactly. Can it be a Liam Neeson ransom? comes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, this well-to-do person staying at a nice hotel, someone's following us, and no one would have found me, no one would have found our bodies. And we get to this expanse. We were the only ones there, Black Sand Beach, Cliffs. Said, you know, there's got to be a better way. And seven years later, and 100,000 hours of research later, we've cataloged 94 categories of data, 
for more than 50,000 beaches in 212 countries. So we've built the world's best beach database. Sandy is basically a Yelp for beaches, and it's the only resource in the world where you can find detailed information about beaches in all of these countries. Not only do we have the data that nobody else has, you can filter through the data. So we've, we've built something for a very small niche in the world. Uh, the global tourism business is $9 trillion a year, and the beach tourism business is $5 trillion of that, but yet there's no beach resource. So we have this little niche, and we're excited for people to find out about us. More than a billion people a year go to the beach, and the most important determinant of where they go is the quality of beach or beaches within that location. So you can find that simply on, on one website. We have all the data. Most people consult 32 different websites before they book a trip. Um, and that's what we've done and we built. And one of the pain points we have is we need photos of all 50,000 beaches. People want to see, in addition to the data, a picture of each beach, what it looks like before they go there. So I started looking through these photos and doing a lot of homework and the due diligence. We have about 30 photos now on our uh, database. We catalog them, we rank them, et cetera, et cetera. License them, they're all license free, et cetera, et cetera. And I started seeing all of these drone photos. I've been a hobbyist photographer really since I was 13. I'm the dad who goes on vacation and takes 1,000 to 3,000 pictures each time. And you know, my kids hate it, but I make them a, a birthday book each year for the year. They'll appreciate photos. it afterwards. Yeah, they, 100%. they love the birthday book. Uh, but I started looking at drones. I bought my first drone five years ago. I think I'm on my ninth or 10th drone. They upgrade. And I started taking these pictures. And my, the quality of my pictures have improved. I never leave home without two drones. And it's something that I really like to do. And people... People like my photos. So you start looking around and you look and see from a business perspective, I love coffee table books. I love photography books. There's only one successful drone beach photographer in the world. and He really doesn't even use a drone. He shoots from a um, helicopter. His name is Gray Mallon. And he's the only one. So I started thinking about, okay, well, there has to be room for a second one. And you try to find another beach uh, photography book online, you can't. And again, the, the art coffee table photography market is, is big. So I looked and see where is, who is this publisher, sent a cold um, email to the CEO. I'm sure you're good at uh, writing those by now. <laughs> the, the, the letter was good. Um, just because of some of the things that I've done, I have 100% um, rate on my um, uh, emails that I uh, send out. It, it's, it works 100% of the time. So he wrote back, some of the photos are up on my website, randallkaplan.com. So I really like your photos too similar to his. So most people would end it that, okay, man, see ya. Thank you. I said, I'd love to get on a phone call on Monday with you. Love to know how the book business works. And I know most people wouldn't do that, but he did it. We spent one hour on the phone together. I wanted to learn about the the book publishing business is something I wanted to do. And at the end of it, I said, you can't do it, but who should I contact? He gave me two names. I, I said, uh, will you make the um, intro for me and uh, you know, link us on, on an um, email? He said, no, but you can mention my name. So I, I sent it out to the first guy. We made a time. He called my photos interesting. And then the second guy was someone named Chris Gruner at Cameron and Company. It's a 70 year old book publisher, high quality um, imprint. And long story short, uh, we signed a book contract, I think three months later. And my book is called Bliss. It's a compilation of my drone beach photography photos from around the world. Um, and I'm super excited for it. It comes out June 15th. It's a great Father's Day gift. And it's been very well received so far. We just had a very nice uh, write up in Frommers this week. When it was released for pre order, it was a bestseller on um, Amazon and four different photography categories. So I'm excited by the book. You know, this is a labor of love. And again, I, I took a labor of love, I took my passion for travel, for beaches, for photography. And then I thought about a business. 
And I said, I'm going to apply some of my business lessons to myself. I cold called the CEO of the book company. And by the way, a funny thing happened. Um, Abrams bought uh, a Cameron and Company six months later. So now I'm back to Abrams. I mean, Cameron is my imprint, but um, Abrams owns a company and there's uh, a sales force is responsible for um, selling my book. But once again, uh, the author's writing letters to CEOs of publishing companies is not a good strategy and is a very low probability outcome. You don't know if you, you do your research like you, Randy. Well, no, it, it, it wasn't. I mean, this was a, a qualitative uh, judgment. You got to like the photos or you don't like the photos. So he likes my photos. People like the photos. But the point is, if you don't ask, you don't get the Sun America job writing to the CEO of a book company. I mean, you got to try. Got to get up to the plate to get a hit. That's chapter three of your next book, which is back to the 65 letters that led me to uh, success, which is ask for the sale, right? 60, 65 meetings, uh, in-person meetings, 15 phone calls, 300 total letters. It, it's gonna, it got to be your next book. I want to read it. Um, so I'm skipping over the, for a second, um, the uh, Akamai. 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 Right. Um, I'm skipping over Akamai for a second to go to surprises in your portfolio for a second. Yeah. Because I would love to hear what, which deal you gave up for dead and what happened. Yeah. Well, that would be a company called Kalipa Networks, which was founded by the former chief evangelist at Sun, the chief Java evangelist at Sun Microsystems, which was a huge company, one of the blue tech, uh, one of the blue chip uh, tech companies founded by Scott McNeely, who actually went to the rival high school where I grew up. I went to Country Day. He went to uh, Cranbrook. This is in Detroit. Did, yeah, in Detroit. Yeah. Um, I didn't know him. I just, yeah, that's an interesting factoid. <laughs> um, so Miko, the CEO, he starts his company. I meet him through the chief of staff at Goldman Sachs who was a partner there and she was doing some tech investing. We'd become friends. So we put money into this company. I can't even remember, but they did. But long story short, they ran out of money and the company basically sold to another company. And, and what that is, it's a um, equi hire situation. So they want the team and you exchange stock into the new company. The company is basically left for dead and it's sort of a hope um, and a prayer that something will um, happen with the new company that will have some kind of a positive result. In my experience, we've had 10 of those and only two have worked. This is the first one that worked. So we gave the company up for dead. They exchanged Kalipa for stock in Pastini. And years later, I mean, we had written it off. Years later, you get the five inch manila bound packet in the mail from a law firm. That's, that's a good packet to get. So that packet said that uh, Google is buying Pistini for $650 million plus another potential hundred million dollars in um, earn out. And we ended up making, I think 10 times our money on a deal that we had given up for debt. And it just, it goes to show you, you never know. And in the venture capital business, there are some companies where we've said, okay, this is, you know, a definite, this is for sure going to work. It's the best thing I've ever seen. And many of those don't work. And sometimes the ones that shouldn't have worked, and this one should not have worked for a lot of reasons, which we found out once we got going, sometimes you get lucky. And, and yeah, that was, that was the best outcome on, on that one, on that front. What do you look for, Randy, in investing in, in tech companies? So a lot of firms do it differently. They look at a variety of factors. Some VC firms won't fund pre-revenue. Certain firms will do uh, the seed stage, which is the first stage, or series A or B or C. We're stage um, agnostic. Most of ours have been seed stage. All the deals that we've done have come from friends in the business, different VC firms, um, entrepreneurs that we funded. And the most important factor for me is 
the CEO and founder of the company or founders of the company. That's always been, for me, the most important ingredient of success. And when I meet with them, we go through the softball questions and I kind of warm it up, but then I throw the zingers in there. And you just want to find out what somebody's made of. I'm very driven. My friends who have known me my whole life have said, you've been very driven since, since I met you. And I feel like I can judge that in different people as well. You look for that killer instinct. You look for that drive. And the mentality that I want to fund in which I had in myself was, if I'm dropped off in the middle of the ocean, I'll find land. Now, I'm horribly afraid of sharks, so I don't want to be dropped off in the middle of the ocean. Um, but that's the mentality that I had, and that's, that's the mentality of the people that, that I want to fund. A relentless persistence. A relentless persistence. Someone once called me, the first little piece that someone wrote about me called me indefatigable. And I had to look up what that means. But that means <laughs> that you keep look. coming back. Okay, you, know, sure. you, 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 you don't give up. You keep coming back for more. Um, and very, very driven and persistent. I love it. I'm going to take a fourth stab at it. Akamai. Akamai. <laughs> Akamai. Jeez, Randy. Akamai. Akamai. So how did that start? So when I was at Sun America, my job was working with a very senior team. I was, I was a technical model on the corporate a development group. One of my titles was managing director of Corp Dev. And that job was an internal investment banking function where we looked for different financial services companies to buy. So I learned how to model, create these 100 page complicated financial models, did research. And my primary job there was doing research. And I was sort of the research guru at the company. But I, I worked on a whole bunch of other things. But I was the very junior guy on a very successful senior team. There were only four people, five people sometimes who came to these meetings. So it was a, it was a great group to work for. The managing director title was, was key. I had meetings with the head bankers at Goldman and Morgan Stanley and all the people, all the leaders in the financial services world from the investment banking perspective. But after a year, I went to um, Eli and I said, I need more to do. And I said, I'm, I'm entrepreneurial. I'm hungry. I want to make an impact. I want to make a measurable impact so I could see what I was contributing. And he told me, you're my first round draft choice. You'll get more playing time this year. And at that point, I started a, uh, a charity event called the Justice Ball from scratch. It was my idea. The long story of that is it was very successful. I got a thousand people to show up at the House of Blues. I had met with the CEO of the House of Blues, 12 phone calls to have lunch with him, told him what I wanted to do. People said, 27 year old can't create uh, charity events and you could never sell out the venue like this. So we sold out the venue, we raised a bunch of money and suddenly the Sun America bosses that was important. I did it for the charity reasons and to give back, but it also showed them I had some other skills. I had leadership skills, organizational skills, clothing, uh, closing skills, sales skills, you know, to raise all this money, bring the group together. I handpicked uh, 20 people to be on the planning committee. One of those people was Doug Amoff, the second gentleman who I've known forever. And, um, People at Sun America took notice. So they knew I was extremely motivated. I, I got a little more playing time the second year. Yeah. And then I, I mean, really when thought, I looked at it, by the way, Randy, yeah. I mean, you've had Billy Idol, the, yeah. you know, Sugar Ray, this, you know, the go go, like so many go people. I think yeah. over 30,000 people ended up attending this, right? Yeah. I think it's in its 25th year now coming up. That's I, amazing. I ran it, yeah, ran it for 10. Um, it's probably, it's the thing I'm most proud of in my career and we can talk about it in a few, but I want to go back to the Akamai story. So there's two ways to leave a job. You can quit and give your, your two weeks notice. I don't think that's, that's the right way to do it. A, a, a good leader 
find his replacement or her replacement before they leave. And he had given me the opportunity of a lifetime. And I, I didn't want to go behind his back. But you talk about fear. I knew I wanted to leave. And I was terrified that he was going to say, get out of the, you know, leave, because I was being um, ungrateful. On the other hand, I was extremely good at my job. Um, you're sort of public and people are looking at you within that job. What is um, Eli Broad like? Tell me what he's like. I, I hear he's so tough. And I, I loved him and never said a negative word. Uh, and the loyalty that I showed to him was huge. And I went to him and I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, you're making a big mistake, but you can stay as long as you want and use your office. We're going to continue to pay you. You're going to still work your uh, tail off. And that's what I did. And at that point, I looked around. I had freedom to look at a few different opportunities. I looked at a whole bunch of things, buying laundry mats, writing novels, which is on my bucket list, and found this opportunity through my then girlfriend who became my wife. Now she's my um, uh, ex-wife, but her brother-in-law was best friends with one of with a graduate student at um, MIT, they had invented technology that was going to improve the efficiency of to deliver content to the World Wide Web. It was very complicated, sophisticated technology. I helped them write a business plan and essentially had a bunch of job opportunities. I took that one. I commuted to Boston. Four of us began the company. Uh, I left for no salary, no funding no CEO. People again thought I was absolutely out of my mind. Uh, what are you doing? You have a great career going. That's a high profile job. And I wanted to be a, an entrepreneur like I wanted to be since I sold t-shirts in college. I always knew I was going to go back to that. And we ended up raising some money. One thing happened, by the way, shortly after I left Sun America, um, Eli sold the company for $18 billion to um, AIG, full vesting event for everybody, $2 million vanished just like that. So uh, I thought, geez, we, we better make this thing work. And that's how it began. They, they wanted me to be part of their team originally because I had a managing director title, and we used that on the business plan that we used for the um, MIT 50K business school competition. That was our first hooray into the real world. Here's what we're doing. And that's how it all began. Amazing. So I have the title of your book, um, which I'm going to keep pitching to you. Uh, for no apparent reason, I get no, nothing yeah. out of it. Because um, out of my mind, you know, the 65, it's a great book. the 65 lessons or meetings that led to my career success or something like that. Um, because people I, kept I telling it. you, I, I, I think I may, you know, maybe we can talk about you being my publicist. Listen, the, <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, first of all, Randy, thank you. I want to point everyone towards your podcast. I have one last question before we end. Oh, um, I want to sure. point everyone to your podcast to check out more in search of excellence and check out all the episodes, check out bliss. Um, the book, we all go to beaches, uh, including me. And, and I agree, there's nothing I'm like, I don't know, we should just head to that one. So probably a resource to, to, to know what we're doing here. And people can check, you know, check out also, you know, jump investors, where else should we point people towards online to check out? Just to term to check out some things that yeah, about you right now? Yeah, what you're working on. Yeah. Well, the podcast is really the big one. It's going to launch May 19th. And the podcast um, in search of excellence is about our desire to be the best we can to achieve our potential to overcome obstacles of which we all face along the way and to, to succeed, how to be the best we can be. And one of the constant themes in that podcast is believing in yourself. I believe in you are four of the most powerful words in the English language. And we're going to reinforce that because so many people out there, they have ideas, they want to leave, they're afraid to do things. Um, and you have to give them the confidence and the ability to believe in themselves, help them just give them a the little push. And 
the speakers that we have on there, you mentioned Sam Zell, uh, Sharon Stone, Cliff Kingsbury, uh, the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals football team. We have a lot of other very good people, great people coming on soon. So you'll have to check in. Uh, but I'm, I'm very focused on that. I'm very focused on the promotion of our book. Sandy is my 70 hour a week job. The others are maybe <laughs> 10 hours a week. I work very, very long hours. Uh, we're raising money now for the first time. So that's exciting. It's, it's going well. And then I have a couple of other things that I'm doing. Also, I have a company called Thrive Par- uh, Fr- Thrive Properties, a real estate company. We're buying apartment buildings. First, we were focusing on Long Beach. We bought four buildings there. It's going very well. We fixed them up and they're beautiful buildings. And then we just bought six townhouses in Nashville. We're super excited about that market. We love Nashville. Amazing things are um, happening there. So we're, we're going to grow that business this year. I started something fun. I like empowering people a lot. We have a vacation home up in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I met my gardener there six years ago. He was my gardener. He's come to me for financial um, advice, building business advice. And I loaned him money uh, for a trucking business. He paid me back. And then we started last year a car restoration business, building old Ford Broncos. So um, I knew nothing. I know nothing about cars. I knew nothing about cars. I know a little something about old cars and rebuilding old cars now. The Ford Bronco business is a huge business. These beautiful old Ford Broncos go for two to three hundred thousand dollars each, and there's no shortage of buyers for them. So we who knew that business? Wow. Yeah, who who knew? Um, you see them, you're driving around town. I think they're beautiful and they are beautiful and they're expensive and there's a good opportunity there and it's, it's fun. So, um, there's really nothing online there. It's called river city restoration. I'll be putting the first Ford Bronco, which should be finished at the end of May up online. Hopefully I, I, it's quite beautiful. I think we'll sell it very soon after it goes for sale. This is not my last question, Randy, um, but... You can keep going, by the way. um, Feel free to keep going. I I love your questions. They're great. uh, This is not my last question, but um, for people listening, you know a lot of people, and you're going to have a lot of interesting guests. Who out there maybe that you don't know that you do want (laughs) to have on the podcast? If someone's listening and they happen to know them, they could happen to introduce them to you. Who who is on your list of guests that you don't know? Sure. It's a long list. Um, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates. Um, there's numerous Nobel laureates I'd love to have on my show. Where I, I want leaders from different fields to talk about what they're doing. It's very important, by the way, for me to have 50% of my guests as women. I work in an um, industry where women are traditionally um, underrepresented. Um, and I've been working with many, many people with causes to try to improve that. We do our share by trying to hire women in our field at our portfolio companies. We have a summer um, intern program where I tell the lead interns who do the hiring, I want 50-50, and we can't get 50-50. We've been trying it for years. Last year, we had around 40%. This year, we're right around the same number, maybe a little less. I'm an advisor to a company called Beyond Board, run by my awesome friend, Sarah Zapp. Shout out to to Sarah. Its mission is to provide opportunities for women to be on private and public company boards. And uh, these things are are very important to me. And they're things that, um, that I'm focused on. So I want I want more women on my show. I want mm-hmm. uh, diversity on my show, particularly with all the, the uh, racial issues that are, I'm happy now that are, that are first and for, for, at, at the forefront. Things that should have been um, addressed long, long, long time ago that thankfully they are being 
today. And it's meant to be educational, thought-provoking, have a broad group of people. But those, those, are, those are some of the few. The okay. list is actually very long. I, it, 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 uh, the list is over 300 people. We'll have to just right post now. it on the episode show notes. So yeah, okay. if you allow it, we'll, we'll put it in. If you know one of these people, recommend them to Randy, introduce Randy to them. My last question, Randy, is, you know, what's been an inspiration for you? One of the things that I found in my research is your grandmother was a big yeah. inspiration for you and to talk about that inspiration and then what you did because in honor of your yeah. grandmother. Yeah. So my grandmother, who's 102 and a half years old, and she wow. still lives alone in Michigan, Jeez. is really my inspiration. She's had a very hard life. She was raised in foster care. Her mother left her when shortly after birth. Her dad dropped her and her sister off when she was six years old, streets of downtown Los Angeles with a, a jacket on their back and nothing else, no money. And she was raised in foster care. Foster care homes often don't, don't treat people well. And, you know, she had a very tough life, uh, tough life. A lot of these foster families treat you like you're a housekeeper. You're the hired help. You have to eat separately. You, know, you sleep in a closet. And that still goes on today, by the way. One of the interns we hired this summer was raised in foster care, had the exact same background. He got a full ride to USC. I'm super pumped to have him this summer. Um, but, you know, my grandmother never graduated high school. She married my grandfather when she was 16 years old. She lied about her age. And we did a, for her um, 85th birthday, uh, I created a video biography for her um, of her life. I wanted to make sure we had it down. We hired a professional film crew. They flew to Detroit. She showed them the first house and all, all kinds of things. And it was really cool. And in the interview, she said that one of her great re regrets was not you know, going to college, even though she had uh, straight A's in um, high school. And by the way, she later gave me her uh, uh, report cards from 1936, which I have. And <laughs> what which a I shock she still had. A, yeah, I mean, A, 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 A. So for her um, 87th birthday, I created a foster care a scholarship um, in her name at the University of uh, Michigan and presented you know, that's her. The student who got it, her name is uh, Cherish uh, Thomas. Shout out to her. And uh, she was living in her car in high school. Uh, we gave her a full ride. She's, she graduated. She's a social worker, a public speaker, a motivational speaker, a mother, a homeowner, and a wife. And she's a member of our family. It's been been one of the best things that I've done. I, I, if, if I look back and I think about all of the positive things I've done, these are the two I'm the most proud of, what I did for my grandmother and uh, Cherish, um, and then what I've done with the Justice Ball. And, and, and then I have another function called uh, the Imagine Ball, which focuses on helping the homeless in Los Angeles, which is the homeless capital of the United States. But what I've done uh, for my grandmother, Cherish has been just one of the highlights of my life. Randy, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you. Everyone check thank out you. In Search of Excellence podcast. Check out Jump Investors. Check out the book Bliss and much more. Yeah. Randy, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I feel like a hundred grand